Welcome to LSE. Uh, my name is Bradley Franks and I'm from the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science at LSE. Um, this department was formed from the um, expansion of the Department of Social Psychology in the last um, several months. And in this expansion we've tried to retain our vision of what we call full cycle research. Research that goes from the lab to the world and back again. We've also tried to retain our vision of psychology as essentially a social science. So it connects with the natural sciences but is also a social science. So when we're developing our department in future years, we hope to develop it along the lines of this vision, bringing in behavioral science, bringing in other approaches to psychology to flesh out this vision and develop it further. Now our expansion has two directions. One is the undergraduate new, new program we're developing which will allow us to train new students and researchers in the nature of psychological and behavioral science. And secondly, we're having new developments in research. And one most important development here is we're setting up a psychological and behavioral science hub. And the aim of this is to bring together social scientists and psychological researchers in a mutually beneficial way. That's our direction. Now, it's an enormously exciting time for us major changes for us, so the changes are changing every week, so watch this space for new developments in the future. But to help us celebrate our expansion, we're going through a series of uh, major public speeches and talks by researchers from around the world who can celebrate the approach to psychological and behavioral science with us. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome David Rand from Yale, who is perhaps the ideal um, speaker to celebrate our new department because he's an associate professor from Yale who is cross appointed in psychology, economics and management. The paragon behavioral scientist if you will. His work is very much psychological but very much behavioral science too. It goes from the lab to the field and back again and his aim is always to refine theory by testing it against real world settings and real world applications. His research is consistently published in perhaps the highest ranking journals in all three of his disciplines. Now this is an enormously um, impressive feat. To publish in the top ranking journals in one area is very good, excellent. In two, it's remarkable. In three, it's extraordinary. Um, so congratulations. Um, and this has led to him receiving many accolades. For example, in 2015, he received the Arthur Greer Memorial Prize for Outstanding Scholarly Research. But don't just take academics' words for this. Um, he gets out there into the real world. He engages with the media. Um, so, for example, in 2012, he was listed in Wired Magazine's Smart List as one of 50 people who will change the world. Have you done so yet? Working, working on it. <laughs> But in the best traditions of full cycle research, he does get out there. He takes his research to the world and engages in public debate, which is exactly what our vision of psychology and behavioral science is all about. Now, at Yale, Dave is the director of the Yale University's Human Cooperation Laboratory. He's also the head of its applied cooperation team. And for the social sciences, his research is absolutely fundamental. The social sciences are about the social. And the social has two dimensions. It has cooperation and competition. But you can't understand one without understanding the other. Cooperation is essential to the progress, prospering of human groups and societies. And it's probably no understatement to say that those groups whose members cooperate most, prosper most, um, succeed most, outsurvive groups whose members do not cooperate. But the sting in the tail is that cooperative groups emerge from behaviors which at the individual level create great costs for the individual. There's something faintly paradoxical here. To be cooperative, you engage in costs for yourself but in the long run it generates goods and benefits for your group. This paradox is at the heart of Dave's work and it's what he's going to be talking about today. It has fundamental connections to theory but also connects to very important practical applications. 
So before we begin the talk, can I just say to people, if you're interested in um, Twitter, um, the hashtag for today's event is um, hashtag LSE RAN. Is it up there? It's not. Okay. I would ask you all please to put your telephones on silent so that we don't disrupt the event. And to also let you know that this evening's event is being recorded. And as long as all goes well with our technology, there will be a podcast sometime next week for this. As usual, after the lecture, there'll be a chance for you to ask Dave any questions you have. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dave Rand to talk about human cooperation. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me uh, to talk. Um, as, uh, as, as was said, what I'm interested in is cooperation. And cooperation is so interesting to me because on the one hand, it's totally essential for everything in life, from the cells in our body, to our personal relationships, our professional relationships, management of organizations, and global level issues like conservation and climate change. Uh, and what all these things have in common is that they're non-zero sum. That is to say, uh, cooperation makes everyone better off, uh, and so it's something that we want to encourage. But at the same time, cooperation is often challenging because it requires individuals to bear personal costs in order to create those collective benefits. So both from the perspective of the selfish process of natural selection and from classical economic models of rational self-interest, cooperation uh, presents a challenge. And so uh, much of what my work is, um, is aimed at is trying to answer the question of why is it that people cooperate? And also, more sort of an applied way, what can we do to get people to be more inclined to cooperate uh, in situations uh, where they're not? And so a big part of the answer to the question of why people cooperate is because uh, cooperation actually pays off in the long run a lot of the time. Uh, so you could say that in some sense, uh, often it's strategic to engage in cooperation. And so uh, the reason that cooperation can pay off is that uh, usually interactions don't happen in a vacuum. If you have two people and uh, say one person cooperates uh, with the other, if that was the end of it, then it would be like, okay, she paid a cost and she's just out that cost. But if they interact repeatedly, then uh, paying the cost to cooperate today can result in you receiving cooperation reciprocally in the future. And so uh, if you're likely enough to interact again with someone in the future, it can be in your long run self-interest to pay that cost of cooperating now to get that benefit. Um, and this is one of the oldest mechanisms for cooperation. There's tons of theoretical and empirical work supporting the power of repeated interactions to make people cooperate. Uh, this also works um, in one-off interactions if there's an observer, because then it benefits your reputation to have cooperated with uh, this person, and so the observer or someone that hears from the observer about what you did might be more uh, inclined to cooperate with you. Zooming out further, you can also get this to work when people are embedded uh, in social networks. That is, when you take into account the fact that interactions aren't random, but you have control over who you interact with to some extent. So say you're connected to some people and you're not connected to others. Uh, and so you, when you cooperate, you're sort of helpful to the people that you interact with. Uh, and you receive reciprocal cooperation from the people that are cooperators here in blue. And you don't receive cooperation uh, from the non-cooperators or defectors, as they're called in the game theoretic language. Um, and so these are sort of mutually beneficial links, whereas these are costly links. And so there's a lot of theoretical work that suggests that if you give people control over their social networks, such that, uh, say, you can say, hmm, this person, well, this person defected last time, so I don't want to be connected to them. And say, oh, hey, this person over here, she's a cooperator, let me connect to her. And so in that sense, when you make networks dynamic, uh, it creates an incentive to cooperate uh, so that people will want to connect with you. Um, and we ran uh, some lab experiments um, where we took uh, people recruited online and we put them into artificial social networks and had them play these kind of cooperation games with them where they could pay costs to benefit each other and then they could uh, update their network or not depending on the condition. And this is just a little snapshot of over a successive rounds of play uh, each node represents uh, one subject, 
the blue subjects are the cooperators, the red subjects are the defectors, and the size of the node is proportional to the number of connections that they have. Uh, and what you see in the fixed network, where people couldn't change uh, who they were connected to, is over time, uh, defection spreads, so more red circles, and in particular, the sort of people in the center of the network were more likely uh, to not be cooperative, and so this is the sort of bad outcome for cooperation. Whereas, when you made the network fluid and give people control over what's going on, you get these dense networks where people get highly interconnected and the defectors get pushed uh, to the outsides of the network. And so we show in these experiments that by making networks dynamic, you can maintain uh, cooperation. So that's at this kind of like uh, larger interpersonal level, but you can also zoom out further to uh, the, the level of real public goods, things that are even uh, global level. So here, if you're a cooperator, you create some uh, benefit for everyone. Uh, like, you know, reducing your energy use or something like that. And so you might think that here, this kind of power to reciprocate doesn't work because your help is sort of diffuse over everyone, and if you stop, uh, co you know, contributing, that hurts everyone. And so uh, this, this kind of collective good, like public good behavior poses a real challenge. But you can still have the power of uh, reciprocity promote cooperation here, when you take into account the fact that these public goods type behaviors have been superimposed on a network of personal relationships. And so if you make it so that people's public goods behavior is observable to the others around them, such that these people can tell whether you cooperated or not in this public uh, setting, then that can lead them to be more likely to cooperate with you in the context of their personal relationships. Uh, and this can allow um, sort of personal reciprocity to maintain global level cooperation. And there are lab experiments uh, from others and from my group showing how this works uh, using lab studies. But I'm going to talk briefly about a study uh, that I uh, co-authored on. But really, this is the work of my uh, collaborator, Erez Yoeli, who is a fantastic uh, field experimentalist. And so uh, Erez ran this experiment where um, this was a collaboration with a utility company in California that was trying to prevent uh, blackouts. So on really hot days, everyone cranks up their air conditioning to uh, you know, make things cold. There's a big spike in electricity demand, and that can overwhelm the grid and cause blackouts. And so they have this program where you can agree to let the uh, utility company automatically turn down the intensity of your air conditioner a couple of degrees on days that are really hot. So it's a standard kind of public good situation where you incur some small cost, but create this collective good for everyone by avoiding uh, blackout. Uh, the problem is nobody signs up for it, basically. They would call, <laughs> they would call the, on the telephone and say, sign up for this, we'll give you $25, and something on the order of 3 or 4% of people uh, agreed. And so what we did in this experiment is tried to harness the uh, power of reciprocity uh, and sort of reputation concerns to motivate people to provision this public good. So instead of getting a phone call, they got that flyer in the mail that explained the program and said it was good for California and you should do it. And it said, if you want to sign up, there's going to be a sign-up sheet in the mailroom of your apartment building. Uh, and in one condition, it said, here's some personal random code that we gave you. Just write down your code and we'll sign you up. And in the other condition, everything was exactly the same, but you also had to put down your apartment number and your name such that it was observable to your neighbors whether you signed up or not. Uh, but in a way that isn't really aggressive, that I'm sure that people didn't think about, oh, I'm, I, the reason they're making me put down my name is so that I'm accountable. It's just, oh, naturally, yeah, you gotta put down your name if you're gonna sign up for something. So there wasn't any kind of like objection to it. But instead, if you look at the fraction of people signing up for the program, uh, the rate in the anonymous condition was roughly the same as the phone calls, and uh, signups tripled uh, in the condition where they had to write down uh, their name. And uh, there also this was crossed with giving a $25 cash incentive, which did essentially nothing. And this free observability manipulation was seven times more effective uh, than the cash incentive. Um, so this is evidence that these kind of things work in the real world. Uh, and Erez and I run this uh, applied cooperation team where we work with lots of different organizations running field experiments trying to apply the basic science knowledge that we learn about cooperation to real world uh, public goods provisioning. So uh, what all of these different uh, mechanisms that I've talked about so far boil down to is they take 
uh, a social dilemma where you have the chance to pay a cost to help someone. Um, in, this, in, in its simplest form, that's just like a one-off anonymous interaction. It's what I'm going to call pure cooperation. Because here, uh, there's no sort of objective payoff maximizing reason to cooperate. No matter what the other person does, you always would be better to avoid the cost. Uh, and what all these different mechanisms do is by creating future consequences for your current behavior, it transforms the social dilemma uh, of pure cooperation into a situation where there are strategic motives to cooperate because it actually becomes payoff maximizing to cooperate if your partner is also cooperative because then they'll reciprocate uh, your, uh, your help. And so this is this fundamental uh, set of solutions to the cooperation problem where if the nature of the problem is how can you get people to do things that are personally costly to benefit others, you can resolve the problem by making it so it's not actually individually costly to cooperate. And then even a totally rational, self-interested person will cooperate uh, in situations where there's this incentive to do so. And I think that this kind of strategic cooperation is really important and explains a lot uh, of human cooperation. And a lot of the goal of policymaking and sort of institution design is to create incentives of this type that make it so it's in people's self-interest to do things that are sort of collectively desirable. But at the same time, it is also very clear both from laboratory experiments and I hope from everyone's personal uh, life experiences that often people are willing to cooperate even in situations where there is not a self-interested motive to do it. Um, that is, people really do engage often in pure cooperation. Um, and you know, rational self-interest can't explain that. Um, and so the question is, why is it that people uh, engage in pure cooperation? And the lens that I'm going to use to think about this problem is a cognitive lens. Uh, I'm going to use the sort of dual process perspective on decision making, which dates back at least to Plato, uh, but is recently popularized by Danny Kahneman. And the idea is that sometimes when people make decisions, they engage in deliberation, careful, rational consideration of all of the different options, and then they pick the one that seems best. And, uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to represent deliberation uh, by my son, Isaac, who uh, one hour after he was born was carefully considering the world uh, in which he found himself. Um, and that's the sort of standard way that people think about decision making. But the key to the dual process theories is that uh, that's not the only way that people make decisions, but a lot of times people rely on more automatic, intuitive, uh, maybe emotional processes. Um, that are sort of, they don't involve cognitive effort, they come to mind sort of spontaneously, uh, but they're in general less sensitive to the details of the situation uh, that they're facing. They're more kind of generalized default responses. And I'm going to resent, I'm going to represent intuition with uh, Isaac's identical twin brother, Miles, who was <laughs> a little less deliberative uh, about uh, what exactly he was facing. So when you think about pure cooperation from this perspective, you have the question of, uh, are you, is the way that people cooperate that they have selfish impulses and then they use deliberation to override it and say, no, the right thing is to cooperate, I need to do it, in which case deliberation is sort of like the hero of cooperation? Or is it that people are sort of intuitively predisposed towards doing the right thing and then when they stop and think about it, the calculus of self-interest undermines those uh, sort of predispositions in which case intuition is the, is the hero of cooperation. And for the last few years, I've done uh, a lot of work trying to investigate this question, and I've found that many people have strong lay uh, feelings about it one way or the other, um, but I try to sort of begin, it by, begin by approaching it from a theoretical perspective and saying, what should we expect the answer to be? Um, you know, why, yeah, you know, rather than saying, well, I just sort of introspected on it and I think it's one or the other, say, what's a principled, uh, principled position? And the way that I do that is by thinking, what are intuitions? Um, like, where do intuitions come from? And uh, I introduced this uh, idea for thinking about it in the social domain that I call the social heuristics hypothesis that uses the general framework of heuristics to think about intuition. And heuristics have been studied a lot in non-social domains. And sort of what I'm doing here is taking that framework into the, into the social domain. 
And so the idea is that behavior that typically works out well in the long run uh, winds up getting internalized as your default sort of intuitive response. If that is, if you're going to have something that's a default, what should it be? It should be the thing that usually works well. Um, but if you deliberate, that lets you stop and say, hmm, I've got this first, uh, this first instinct, usually it works out well, but is this actually a situation where it fits, or is this a situation where I should override it? Uh, and when you apply this lens to uh, cooperation, the, uh, what I would argue is that because typically we're in situations that involve future consequences, in particular, the important interactions for our life success, the interactions with our friends, our family, our coworkers, are situations where there are a lot of future consequences and there are strategic sort of self-interested reasons to want to cooperate. And because these are typical interactions, we wind up developing uh, automatic intuitive defaults that favor cooperation. It feels right to cooperate. But when you find yourself in situations that you actually could exploit the other person and get away with it, then when you deliberate, you override uh, that impulse to cooperate and switch to being selfish. And um, this is, uh, we propose this verbally. We also have a formal game theoretic model that shows how you can have a strategy that's either consistent with rational self-interest or can be favored by evolution, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, that has this flavor where if there's costs involved in deliberating and figuring out exactly what kind of environment you're facing, if typically uh, it's, a, it's, it's environments where it's advantageous to cooperate, then the good strategy is to intuitively cooperate. Uh, so this theory generates clear testable predictions. Uh, in the context of pure cooperation, where there's no self-interested motive to give, here, deliberation should undermine cooperation because you have an intuition that says cooperate, you stop and think about it, you realize here's a situation where I can get away with being selfish, I won't cooperate. Uh, whereas in situations that there are strategic motives to cooperate, in situations where it can pay off uh, to cooperate, there when you deliberate, you should say, oh yes, it feels right to cooperate and that's actually a good idea here, I should stick with it. Um, so the prediction is uh, into, uh, deliberation should undermine intuition when there's not a self-interested motive to cooperate, but should support cooperation when there is a self-interested motive. And uh, to, protect, to, to test this, um, this set of predictions, uh, run a lot of experiments uh, over the last four or five years. Um, and what I'm going to present now, instead of talking about specific experiments run by me or run by other groups, I'm going to talk about a recent uh, meta-analysis uh, that I published where um, I took together a whole bunch of data uh, looking, uh, these are experiments in which people got real money and made a choice of how much to keep for themselves and how much to give up to benefit one or more other real people. Um, and there was two different types of these experiments. There were pure cooperation experiments where there's no self-interested motive to do this. And then there are other experiments uh, where there is a self-interested motive because the partner will get to respond. Either it's just I make a choice and then the partner makes a choice or you have actual repeated games. But in both cases, because there's some potential for reciprocity, it actually can be strategically payoff maximizing to cooperate. Uh, so that's one dimension along which the studies vary. And the other is uh, all of these studies involve experimental manipulations in which people are induced to rely relatively more on intuition or relatively more on deliberation. And there's a bunch of different ways this is done. Uh, one approach is using time constraints. So you tell some of the people, please decide as quickly as you can. You have to decide less than 10 seconds, for example. And the other people, you say, carefully consider your decision. You have to wait and think for at least 10 seconds before you decide. Uh, there are cognitive load experiments where you get people to do some cognitively demanding task at the same time that they're making their decision in the game, like holding a seven or eight digit number in memory. And the idea is that uses up some of your de deliberative resources and so you're able to deliberate less uh, and you're sort of more driven by uh, your intuitive response. There are ego depletion experiments, which is basically the same thing, but instead of doing the cognitively more or less demanding task while you make your decision, you, you do it beforehand, and so it sort of depletes your 
uh, either ability or willingness to deliberate. Um, and then so you rely more on intuition when you make your decisions. And then there are also intuition inductions, uh, the simplest of which is just straightforward asking people, you know, follow your emotions or think carefully, or slightly more subtle things where you have people recall a time in their life where they followed their intuition and it worked out well, or where they're carefully reasoned and it worked out well, thereby inducing them to be relatively more intuitive or more deliberative. And so I collected all of the studies that I could find that met these criteria, both that were published and also I solicited unpublished uh, studies from people. And I got in total 67 studies from 26 groups, uh, 26 research groups, um, for a total of 17,000, over 17,000 observations. Um, and an important uh, issue with meta-analyses is that meta-analyses are great because they get, let you aggregate lots of data together and see what the overall pattern is, but it relies on having an, an unbiased set of studies in, in the first place. And there's lots of issues with publication bias where only positive results get published, uh, you know, and people do sketchy things to try and get their papers published by trying all different covariates until they get one set that gets to P equals 0.049 and then send it off and things like that. But in this data set, there are tests you can do to test for that, and there's no evidence of either publication bias or of this P hacking where people do sketchy things with P values. Um, and this is in part because I solicited unpublished studies in part because uh, the discipline, this sort of straddle psychology and economics, um, and there's a lot of tradition of posting working papers um, and things like that. Uh, and also, I redid all of the data analysis myself um, in a consistent way across all the studies, so there's not room for the kind of p-hacking thing going on. Okay, so what happened? Um, I this can go into a lot of detail in the paper about all the ins and outs of the meta-analysis, but the basic uh, result is if you look at the pure cooperation studies, there was 17% more cooperation in the conditions where intuition was promoted relative to the conditions where deliberation was promoted. So consistent with the predictions, uh, in, in pure uh, cooperation settings where there's not a self-interested reason to cooperate, uh, people are more cooperative when they go with their intuition than when they deliberate. Um, and if you do an intent to treat effect, uh, you also get a similar result. Um, in contrast, if you look at strategic cooperation, there was essentially zero difference uh, between the intuitive and deliberative conditions in cooperation, uh, which is consistent with the prediction. When people deliberate here, they realize, oh yes, it's a good idea to cooperate. I should keep cooperating. Um, and uh, to, to show this a little bit better, I'll show that the, the, the basic uh, the core of the prediction, or the core of the theory, is that intuition provides this generalized response, isn't super specific to the strategic details you're facing, and so you make it cooperation because on average that's the thing uh, that works well. And so uh, if we take now and we look at the average level of cooperation across the combination of strategic versus pure cooperation and more intuitive versus more deliberative, uh, what you see is that, as I said on the last slide, the deliberation doesn't reduce strategic cooperation. So when there's a self-interested motive to cooperate, cooperation is comparatively high in both conditions. Um, then when, uh, in situations where there's not a self-interested reason, deliberative people, as you would expect, cooperate substantially less because they respond to the incentives and they shift in the direction of being selfish because there's not uh, you know, that's what's payoff maximizing. Um, and so the key idea here is that the reason that intuitive people should be more cooperative in these pure uh, situations is because they adjust less. They're less sensitive to the changing of the incentives, and indeed that's what we see. That uh, there is less of a decrease in cooperation in the people that you don't let deliberate as much. And so the reason there's more pure cooperation for the intuitive people than the deliberative people is they adjusted less uh, when the incentives change. So uh, this is evidence in support of this prediction that intuition favors cooperation from a whole lot uh, of lab experiments uh, aggregated together. But um, as was said uh, in the introduction, I think it's really important to look not just at what happens in the lab, but to also look in the field. And so I'm going to tell you about a very nice study run by another group. Uh, now, I didn't have anything to do with this other than admiring it very much. Uh, and so they ran this experiment in, 
and The Hague, and what they did is they set up in a park where there was a long uh, straight road, so they could, uh, or walkway, so they could see people coming from far away. And they set up a thing where this Confederate uh, dropped a glove and then went over to unchain her bike. And then and they, and they set it up so that they did it when they saw a person coming. And the question is, does the person stop and say, hey, you dropped your glove, or give them the glove, or do they just keep rolling? Uh, and they manipulated, so this is a pure cooperation setting, and they manipulated uh, the level of intuition versus deliberation by uh, changing how long, like, uh, how far away the participant was when the confederate dropped the glove. And so you've got the person with the glove here, and in the time pressure condition, uh, they waited until the person was 3.5 seconds away before they dropped the glove. Uh, and in the more deliberative condition, they gave them 6.5 seconds. And they drop and then immediately turn around, so it's clear that they don't know that the glove is there. Uh, and as, uh, you know, consistent with the theory and the prior work, you see that people were substantially more likely to stop and say, hey, you dropped your glove, when it was only, they only had three seconds to think about it, uh, than when they had six seconds. So this is some nice evidence of this working uh, in the field. Um, another thing that you uh, might, might wonder about is what happens if the cost is bigger? So all of these things are pretty low cost in these experiments. It's paying something like, you know, from a few cents to a few dollars. Um, and here it's taking a second to pick up a glove. But uh, what about higher cost things? And um, it's hard to study uh, the ultimate cost in the lab. We're not allowed to ask people to risk their lives. Uh, but so we wanted to get some insight into this. And so we thought we could take advantage of um, the fact that there are all of these accounts of people risking their lives to save strangers. And uh, we um, collected, uh, there's the Carnegie uh, Hero uh, Award. They give out medals to people that are civilians, not in the course of their work, that risk their lives to save strangers. And so we collected interviews that these heroes had given with news organizations right after they um, did their heroic actions. Uh, and then we had subjects rate them on a scale from one to seven as like sort of intuitive fast uh, decisions or sort of reasoned slow decisions. We, we took excerpts from the interviews just where they described how they made their decision. Then we had subjects rate them. And obviously there's a lot of problems uh, from a scientific perspective with this because it's after the fact recounting, it's to a newspaper where you know everybody's going to read it. Uh, so, you know, we take it with many grains of salt, but it's, you know, it's a, a one way to get some window into what happens in these extreme situations. And so we had these uh, 312 subjects rate these statements from the 51 heroes, and this is the distribution of subject ratings, which is very massively skewed in the direction of uh, fast, intuitive statements. Only one out of the 51 heroes was an average rating above the midpoint in the deliberative direction. And to show that the, that the subjects knew what they were doing, we also compared this to having subject, the same subjects rate controls were either uh, had been generated specifically about intuition or specifically about deliberation. And as you can see, the Carnegie heroes look pretty much identical to the intuitive controls and radically different from the deliberative controls. And to give you a flavor of the kind of things that people said, they said things like, I'm thankful I was able to act and not think about it. Or I just did what it felt like I needed to do. And I like this one in particular because it suggests that if they'd stopped and thought about it, they wouldn't have done it. Um, and, you, and also, this isn't just about heroes not having enough time to act. Because you know, if the train is coming, if you take more than two seconds to decide if you're going to jump in front of the train and save the guy, it's too late. But you can restrict just to the subset of heroes who had at least a minute to make their actions, and you still get the same pattern. Um, so. Uh, this is evidence, of, the further evidence in support of this, uh, this story about why people cooperate in situations where it's not self-interested for them to do it. Uh, and so one of the implications of this theory of human uh, prosociality is that um, if the idea is you internalize behavior that is typically advantageous, that means that you can have some amount of top-down influence on what people feel uh, is right. So that if you have good institutions, be it within your organization or within your country uh, and so on, uh, good, you can design institutions 
that make it so that cooperation uh, typically pays off. So you can reward people for cooperating, you can sanction people for not cooperating, and importantly, I don't just mean material rewards and punishments, but also things like recognition and setting up reputation systems so people can be accountable to each other. But if you can, in general, that is to say, I, I'm construing the word institution quite broadly. Um, but when there's either good formal or informal institutions in place that make it so that cooperation pays off in the long run, that can lead to people internalizing cooperation as their default, as their sort of the way that they feel about what's right. And vice versa, where if you have bad institutions, and so it's typically not a good idea to cooperate with people, you can wind up internalizing non-cooperation as your default. And uh, what this suggests is that you can use good institutions to build cultures of cooperation. So like within an organization, if you reward people and recognize people for being cooperative, that can help get people in the habit of cooperating, even in situations where there's not going to be any reward for doing it. And to provide some laboratory uh, evidence for this, we've done several experiments, one of which I'll tell you about here. So in this experiment, it's a two-stage experiment. And in the first uh, stage, people are put in groups of three, and they play a 10-round public goods game. So this is a game where uh, each round, people get some money, uh, 140 experimental units, and they choose how much to keep for themselves and how much to contribute to a common project, where all of the contributions get doubled by 1.2 and split equally among the three people. So it's, it's a pure cooperation setting where uh, contributing benefits others, but because uh, if you, for every unit you put in, it gets doubled to 1.2 and split three ways, that means you're only getting 40 cents back on the dollar. So individually, no matter what the other people do, it's costly for you to contribute, but if everyone contributes, you're better off than if no one contributes. This is a sort of standard social dilemma. <clears throat> and then we experimentally manipulated the institution. Uh, in one condition, in the low quality institution, that's it. There's nothing to, to make cooperation uh, advantageous. But in the high quality institution condition, they're told that there's an inspection mechanism, and that every round, uh, there's some chance, like say a 20% chance, that your, uh, your, your contribution will be inspected, and if you didn't ins uh, contribute the maximum amount, you'll get fined. So that creates an incentive, in a sort of heavy-handed way, an incentive to cooperate. And then, after they finish this 10-round game, uh, they go on and say, okay, now you're matched with a totally new person, not someone you interacted with before, and here's some money, and how much do you want to give to this other person? So it's totally non-strategic, no reason to give anything to the other person except for the goodness of your heart. Uh, and the prediction is that the people who, from the high quality institution, will cooperate more in the first stage, sort of get in the habit of cooperating, and then be more altruistic in the second stage as a result, from sort of cultivating the habit of cooperativeness. And uh, we tested this by recruiting about 500 people from uh, this online labor market, although I should say that actually these results we've recently replicated uh, with Kenyan general population um, in the Busara lab in, in Nairobi, so they're sort of uh, not unique to the internet. Um, so in the first stage, uh, what you see is that, so this is the, for the 10 rounds, the average amount contributed to the public good, and in the low quality institution you see a a standard tragedy of the commons type situation where people wind up, start out being reasonably cooperative and then cooperation decays over time. Uh, whereas in the uh, condition where there was an inspection mechanism, so there was an institution helping incentivize them to cooperate, things look very different. They start out more cooperative and they stay cooperative the whole time. So that's just a manipulation check. Our institution successfully gets people to either cooperate or defect. And then uh, afterwards, we get them into this unilateral money-giving situation. And what you see is the people that got used to cooperating in the first stage are substantially more generous than the people that got used to cooperating in the second stage. Um, and this isn't an income effect because we uh, make it so they only get paid, they pick one stage at random to get paid for. Um, so it's not just the fact that uh, these guys earned more by being in cooperative groups, the, the high institution ones. So this is evidence that you can get uh, these spillover effects from good institutions influencing in a positive way what people do uh, when the institutions are taken away. And it works with this kind of top-down punishment. It also works with more like peer incentives. We have a version of this experiment uh, that we published before this one where um, 
people either interact repeatedly with each other or they are usually remixed with strangers. And so that interpersonal accountability also leads them to learn to cooperate and to be more pro-social and altruistic afterwards. Um, so uh, this shows the kind of um, practical implications that this theory of habit-based cooperation uh, makes. And so in everything that I've been talking about so far, uh, I've been making uh, the argument that the reason that intuition is uh, advantageous is that it's cognitively easy, it's, it's fast, you know, it's effortless. But there's also another set of reasons to expect people to, gauge, to engage in uh, intuitive cooperation. And this work that I'm about to talk about was really driven by my brilliant graduate student, Jillian Jordan, and so this is really her, uh, her work. And uh, the idea is that if you, in, if you respond intuitively, like as I've been arguing, the, what I mean by intuitive is sort of in generalized and insensitive to context, that means that if I see you engage in cooperation in a certain setting, in an intuitive way, then I can be reasonably confident that you're likely to cooperate in other settings where the strategic incentives might be different because you're not calculating, you're being insensitive to the details of the situation, so it suggests that you will be, in general, a cooperative person. Whereas if I see you very carefully deliberate in a particular setting and then decide to do the right thing, then I can think, okay, well, I can trust you in this setting, but if I see you in a different setting where the incentives are different, you might behave differently, and so I can't trust you uh, in general. And so uh, another way of saying this is we I talked a lot at the, at the beginning about reputation effects and how your past behavior can influence the way people behave towards you in the future, and so it creates these reputational reasons to behave well. And the idea here is it's not just that your decisions uh, matter, but also the process through which you get to reach those decisions also carries reputational information. Um, and so what uh, Jillian showed in this study is that if you put people uh, in a situation where they can pay costs to benefit others, and either they can, uh, in, one, in one experiment we looked at whether they decide quickly or they took a long time to think about it, and another one we said, we're not gonna tell you how costly it is to help. You just have to decide, do you wanna find out the cost or do you wanna help without knowing how much it's gonna cost you? We then had them go on and have other people decide how much to trust them, and uh, as you might imagine, and consistent with some prior work, we found that people that chose to be helpful without looking at the cost or without uh, thinking about it for very long were seen as more trustworthy than people that helped after calculating. And what we showed here is that as a result of that, people were more likely to engage in uncalculating cooperation when they knew that others were gonna be able to see how they made their decision. So if we tell you, uh, people are going to be able to see whether you looked at the cost or not, uh, then you see that uh, a substantially smaller fraction of the people choose to find out the cost of helping before they help. And similarly, if we tell you that uh, your partner is gonna know whether you decided quickly or whether you really had to stop and think about it, people decide significantly more quickly uh, than if the partner isn't gonna know. So this suggests that not only is there a sort of cognitive uh, ease, um, sort of you know, uh, cognitive limits um, motivation for intuitive cooperation, but also there's a strategic reputational motive to be the kind of person that calculates in general. And so in our experiments, this was likely calculated uncalculating this, if you see what I mean, that people thought, oh, here's a situation where I had better look uh, uncalculating or, uh, you know, it will cost me. But we think it's likely that people also engage in meta-uncalculating cooperation uh, because there also probably are reputational benefits to, uh, to being seen as not someone that calculates whether you should calculate and so on. Um, so uh, to summarize, um, in general, in terms of the question of why do people cooperate, a lot of cooperation is motivated by the fact that future consequences typically exist for your current behavior. And when there are future consequences, that can make cooperation pay off in the long run. If the other people you're interacting with are also cooperative and will only cooperate with you if you're willing to cooperate, 
then you have a strategic, self-interested motive to cooperate. And in these types of situations, uh, we actually have a paper that shows that uh, how altruistic you are doesn't predict how cooperative you are. Because whether you're selfish or you're altruistic, everybody understands that you should be cooperating because that's how you get ahead in the context where there are future, uh, future consequences. But it's also very clear that people are willing to cooperate even when there are not future consequences and there's no self-interest reason to do it. And uh, I sort of ex have explored that kind of pure cooperation through this cognitive lens of uh, intuition versus deliberation where I conceptualize intuition as these relatively easy but uh, inflexible uh, types of processes. And because the process is relatively inflexible, not sensitive to the details of the situation it's currently facing, your intuitions should be shaped by what typically works out well. And uh, for most of the subjects in our experiments that were drawn from you know, Western countries with good institutions and strong norms of cooperation, uh, that means that intuition uh, should favor cooperation. And that's what we found uh, across this meta-analysis of many studies. Um, whereas deliberation leads people to be selfish selectively in the situations where it actually is self-interested to not cooperate. When self-interest favors cooperation, deliberation also favors cooperation. Uh, and uh, the implication of this theory of cooperation is that you can influence the extent to which people behave pro-socially and really sort of have pro-social preferences by designing the institutions uh, under which uh, they sort of live and work to reward cooperative behavior such that people uh, internalize it. Um, and uh, finally, people engage in this kind of intuitive, uncalculating cooperation also for reputational benefits. And so there's an added motive above and beyond cognitive ease, uh, which is looking like a reliable partner. So uh, if you want an overview of a lot of this work, this review article um, is a good place to start. It talks about lots of experiments on human cooperation of many different flavors. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks to these are the people that I cooperate most often with. Uh, my lab at Yale. These are other people that I uh, cooperate a lot with. Uh, in particular, a big shout out to uh, Erez Ueli, who is really doing great field experiment work that I think people here would find uh, particularly interesting. Uh, thank you to the funders um, who funded this work. And here's a selection of most of the papers that I talked about here. So thank you so much, and I'd love to hear questions. Dave, thank you for an absolutely inspiring talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience, or should I begin? There's a person in the third row. Can you give us an indication of your affiliation and your name, please, before you ask the question? Dr. Keith Postler, affiliated um, to LSE. Um, you posed the question, why cooperate? And you said it had a payoff long run. Um, I want to take up a question on long run. Um, do you have a view culturally about um, instant gratification? Uh, in Western culture, uh, people, um, for marketing reasons, uh, for media, marketers, um, various sources, uh, are encouraged um, to exercise instant gratification. Um, this is not long run. Does that override uh, a long run perspective? Yes. Yeah, Does certainly. it invalidate the yeah, kind of so, so it's certainly the case that the key to uh, these kind of future consequences and long run benefits being able to promote cooperation is that people have to be sufficiently patient uh, to wait for those future benefits. <clears throat> and so it is the case empirically that people that are more impatient, that more demand immediate gratification, tend to cooperate less, uh, which makes perfect sense. And so, I mean, I don't know of any data about the sort of society level implications of what you're talking about, but it's interesting and it does seem plausible to me that a general shift in the direction of, me of immediate gratification would not be good for, uh, for cooperation. <clears throat> 
Hi, uh, my name is Zach Clements, and I'm in the MPA at LSE. And uh, I wanted to ask about group size uh, and how much that was in your analysis or others. You know, Olson is all about talking about the size of groups, and uh, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> in general, the idea is the bigger the groups are, the harder it is to get cooperation to work because <clears throat> the, basically the less people are keeping track of each other. Um, but I think it's still quite possible to maintain cooperation in very large groups because you don't need every person in the group to know what every other person in the group is doing. And so if you have this kind of local information sharing that I was talking about, where people's sort of group level behavior is made observable to those around them, it's a way that you can leverage the sort of power of small, even dyadic pairwise interactions to promote larger cooperation in a way that's group size independent. So like we have a, a set of experiments um, in this vein where we show that you can get with just uh, one or two pairwise prisoners dilemmas, you can get people to be willing to cooperate in public goods games as large as a thousand other people and that the amount that they cooperate is totally insensitive to the size of the total group because the thing that matters is that these other couple of people are, are you know, conditioning their behavior on them. So that's one part of the answer. But the other thing is that it's true that as groups get bigger, you have, uh, if there aren't good institutions in place, you have more and more of your pairwise interactions with strangers that you're not gonna see again. And so I think that's a, a lot of the place where institutions play a really important role in stabilizing cooperation as things get big. And that can come in the form of institutions that impose formal sanctions themselves on bad actors. So one way that you can you know, just discourage you know, me from taking advantage of some person I meet on the street out in front of LSE that I'm never gonna see again is that I know that if I do, I might have to go to jail. But another way that institutions work is by uh, creating and facilitating reputation systems so that even if you don't know the person or you're not ever gonna see them again, if you behave badly, other people will know about it. And so a version of that that I really like is Yelp. If you think about uh, the sort of the phenomena of a restaurant that's a tourist trap, that is there are these like really bad restaurants in very touristy locations. And the reason is most of their customers are one-time customers. And so there's no incentive to provide a good meal because the person is never gonna come back anyways. Um, and what Yelp does is it creates a generalized reputation system or a sort of global memory where one one-shot partner can leave information for a future one-shot partner. And so I think of like Yelp as the restaurant trap, or as the tourist trap killer. Um, and it's like a, an example of the kind of solution that you can have to this scaling problem. <clears throat> Any further questions at the front? Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I'm, I'm Anupriya. I'm actually a student at LSE uh, of organizational psychology. Um, so ever since I read up uh, Sigmund Freud, his view of humans is innately that we're driven by unconscious desires and these selfish sort of motives and very animalistic behavior. Um, but when I look at intuitive cooperation, it sort of makes me feel, is it, is it trying to indicate that humans are innately good and probably sort of moving towards positive psychology and not... Uh, the Freudian view of the world? Uh, it's an interesting question. I mean, the way that I think about it is that, um, is that, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I don't think that the, the, the data that I have showed in general about this intuitive cooperation um, is in and of itself agnostic as to whether we are sort of hardwired to be intuitively cooperative, or it's like a sort of learned uh, heuristic or something like that. But I think that the experiments that I showed where exposing people to different incentives change their sub subsequent behavior, as well as lots of evidence on big cross-cultural differences in levels of cooperativeness, suggest to me uh, that it's not a hardwired thing, um, but that it is shaped by the incentive that you face on a regular basis. And for example, um, you know, it's like, it, it seems like from a theoretical perspective, it should be like that also, because if I was going to evolve an optimal agent, I wouldn't want to evolve someone that was hardwired to have their default be cooperation, because um, uh, 
whether it's good to cooperate or not depends on what the people around you are doing. If you're in a situation where it's a small group, you have lots of repeated interactions, so these mechanisms for cooperation are in place, but most of the other people that you interact with uh, are not cooperative, then it doesn't matter that there are future consequences. It's still not a good idea for you to cooperate. And in the game theory language, you can be stuck in a non-cooperative equilibrium, where even though these mechanisms are in place, it's still not a good idea to cooperate. So it seems like you shouldn't hardwire agents to be built to cooperate, but you should build agents that can uh, adjust to the environment in which they find themselves in. And so that makes me think it's most likely a sort of socially learned uh, heuristic uh, type mechanism. And so I don't think that the implication is that people in general are, uh, you know, have a, have a cooperative instinct or something like that. But instead, the more general take home of this work is that <clears throat> intuitions should favor the behaviors that are typically advantageous. And so if you're a person for whom cooperation is typically advantageous, then, uh, you know, you should have, it should be intuitive to cooperate, but if not, then not. And a flip side of that is it also means that uh, cooperation shouldn't be intuitive in all situations. Uh, for example, if, if the key mechanism that drives a lot of the cooperation, the strategic cooperation that I was talking about before, is the idea of future consequences, which is to say, if I cooperate today, other people will cooperate with me in the future, in order for that to work as an incentive, it has to be the case that if you don't cooperate, other people won't cooperate with you in the future, or other people will punish you in the future. And so this logic of sort of reciprocity as the core building block of cooperation suggests that uh, for people in situations where they're in this good reciprocal cooperative uh, state of the world, cooperation should be intuitive when you first meet someone and don't have much background on them, Cooperation should be intuitive if they've cooperated with you, but if they have not cooperated with you, if they have tried to exploit you, or you have reason to believe, based on what they've done with others, that they're not cooperative, then the intuition should be to not to cooperate with them, but to defect or even to punish them. <clears throat> and in fact, there is a good amount of evidence that suggests that this is the case. Um, there's a lot of experiments where people have the opportunity to uh, pay costs, to impose costs on people for bad, for bad behavior, so punishment experiments. And uh, there are a lot of them that do the same kind of inducing people to rely more on intuition versus more on deliberation. <clears throat> and what you see in those experiments is uh, what would be predicted here, which is that uh, intuition favors punishment. And getting people to sort of deliberate makes them cool down and say, OK, maybe I will not Punish, I'll just sort of save, you know, I won't, I won't, waste, I won't waste money on punishing this person. Yeah, um, you referred uh, to some studies looking at how uh, trust really uh, is built where someone has the chance to observe someone else spontaneously cooperating. Mm -hmm. However, in real-life situations, thinking perhaps of uh, small businesses, people often have to decide whether to trust someone or not, to cooperate with someone or not, uh, without any opportunity to observe any kind of uh, relevant behavior. And yet, many people believe and uh, are often credited with the ability to uh, detect who's trustworthy, who's not. So, do you know of any research that where those people are looking for some kind of relevant cues, or irrelevant cues for that matter? Uh, yeah, so there, there definitely is work on what kind of subtle cues like that people use. Um, I think, so I, I don't know that work super well, but my understanding is things like people trust attractive people more. Um, you know, and there are certain, you can make like an archetype untrustworthy face. And so there are there studies where people, you, you see a picture of the face of the person you're supposedly playing a trust game with and they look at how people respond to trustworthy versus untrustworthy faces, <clears throat> and there is, uh, there's certainly a signal there. I don't have the sense that the signal is, uh, or rather, people, that people discriminate based on some on cues. My sense is the cues are not very accurate. 
Um, but there are these cues that people pick up on, and there's also evidence that that is an automatic process, and that sort of pe putting people under cognitive load doesn't change their, you know, the extent to which they look at these trust cues and things like that. Um, but that's certainly the kind of thing that you would expect. Uh, these intuitive processes, although the intuitive processes aren't great at picking up on uh, strategic details of the situation, there is a good amount of evidence that uh, these in intuitions are sensitive to those kinds of subtle cues and also to kind of like social cues um, that you know, you're more able to, to pick up without having to carefully think about it. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, a few buildings down, there's another lecture taking place on Brexit. And I can't help not correlating the two. How can we reach a point where cooperation helps social inclusion and therefore people think of the common good before they do something? Even in corporations, even in um, economy, business, and so forth. And actually getting everyone on board so we won't have these issues, so to speak. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, so that's the ultimate question behind all of this. And uh, I think that um, it's hard. <laughs> <clears throat> but but I, th I think that, that part of the answer, at least, is that um, if you, to whatever extent you can make it so that people are recognized and celebrated and rewarded for being globally minded, uh, that creates, you know, it creates an incentive to do it, and it also creates a sense that that's the right thing to do. And so some version of that is, um, you know, you can, you can do that from a top-down level, uh, but often it's the people in the positions of power that you're trying to change uh, the behavior of. So, you know, ideally de democracy helps you vote for people that are more globally minded if that's what you think should happen. Um, also, you know, you can boy, boycotts are another form of these kind of collective action things of people trying to change the incentives for businesses to behave in a way that's more uh, that's more globally minded. Um, an interesting perspective on things like Brexit and the recent presidential election uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, that uh, Valerio uh, Capraro here has uh, been talking to me a bunch about that links into this uh, fast and slow sort of idea is that if uh, deliberation allows you to be more sort of future oriented uh, and these sort of more intuitive hot processes are more present oriented, um, then if it's the case that there are kind of immediate gratification uh, maybe a, a sort of emotional rewards that come with things like voting for Brexit or voting for Trump, because you feel kind of like, yeah, I'm going to stick it to him, or whatever, and with, but not really thinking carefully about what the long-term consequences of that are, that can get people uh, to do, you know, to, to vote for those sorts of things, uh, maybe who, in retrospect, uh, regret it. Um, and also that might help to explain why there's such a mismatch between the polls and what people actually did when they're in the voting booth. Because when you answer a poll, it's sort of detached, cold, whatever. And when you get in the, in, the, in the booth, it's hot. And you're like, you know, you're more swayed by those uh, short-term ideas. The key uh, question that that hinges on is, is it in fact the case that people that see short-term benefits for voting for things like Brexit, Brexit acknowledge that there are long-term costs uh, or not? And it's unclear to what extent that's the case. But and another thing, actually, about a way that this stuff ties into uh, at least what happened in the American election, I think, is that a very common criticism of Hillary Clinton is that she was too calculating. And one of the things that people really liked about Trump was that he was clearly uncalculating. <laughs> uh, and, like, it was so maddening to be like, how, like, how did, like, why, like, why does that seem like a good thing? But I think that the, the research that I was talking about here helps to explain that, which is that in the context of your personal relationships, it's often 
desirable to have people that are uncalculating, at least in, in certain domains, and domains that involve morality and prosociality and stuff like that. You like uncalculating people that are willing to just do the good thing because you know you can rely on them. And so I think that there's some extrapolation of that kind of preference for uncalculatingness that people then bring into the political sphere um, and say, I, I feel like the uncalculating person I can trust to not be swayed by uh, you know, all the incentives that will be in place once they're in power. But like, if you're going to think about it that way, you should hope that the uncalculating person is pro-social in the first place. Because uh, one of the results from, the, from that paper is that <clears throat> if you look at uh, the way that people respond to uh, other people calculating, so this is the sort of level of trust that was shown in people uh, as a function of whether they were helpful or selfish, and then also whether they, looked, uh, whether they were calculating or not calculating. And so what you see is that among people that were helpful, the ones that helped without looking at the cost are trusted more than the people that helped after they looked. But among people that didn't help, there's not really much of a difference. And if anything, it goes slightly in the other direction. Uh, and when you look at the um, looking times ones, so these are the people that helped quickly versus the people that helped slowly are trusted more, but people that didn't help slowly are, uh, are better than people that didn't help quickly. That is, if you're going to be selfish, at least don't do it without calculating, because that suggests you will, in general, be selfish. Um, and there's, there's various other studies out there that find more extreme versions of this, where doing a bad thing in an uncalculating way is a particularly bad signal. And so, at least based on my assessment of, uh, of the state of the world, uh, it seems like um, that, was not a good cal cal that was not a good calculation. <laughs> Um, some, some of what you've just said may answer my question. I'm thinking about people who game the system and certain sorts of confidence tricksters who would um, create a, a local area of good feeling and move on quickly before they were found out. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that when people say steal £10,000 in a, in, a, in a burglary without injuring people, the way that's reported in the press is quite different from, say, a bank clerk stealing 10,000, or somebody raiding a pension fund compared with somebody running a business badly. So there's the, the way, when, it, when people are found out in this sort of way, this is not always altru altru altruistic situations, but it, it possibly covers some, something. Somebody who pretends to have cancer to, to get, a, get a, uh, a charitable donation from people, when they're found out, they're very much slated in the press. There seems to be there's a, a, a different standard of report if somebody uh, has used trustworthiness as a way of getting around somebody. And also some people don't like to report that they've actually been deceived. Right. It's a very complicated thing there, I think. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I think that like, it makes a lot of sense that <clears throat> someone who, uh, that is, it's worse to both steal and betray someone's confidence than it is to just steal because it's like you know, two bads instead of one. But I agree that it feels like there's this extra particularly sort of hot emotional salience of exploiting someone's trust. That's part of the punishment by exposing it in a very vigorous way is part of the institutional means of controlling it. That's what I'm suggesting. I see. Yeah, that's, that's possible. Although it could also be that the direction of causality is the other way which is that people uh, find, because if, if your sort of moral intuitions are shaped by your social interactions, then the idea of someone socially exploiting you or socially exploiting someone else's trust is particularly aversive and particularly likely to trigger those kind of hot feelings of a desire for retribution. And it could be that those intuitions informed, like built, basically built the lay theory that the institutions and the punishments were shaped around uh, rather than the other way around, which is, uh, which is an interesting question. Um, and this also makes me think of some other work that we have uh, done recently. Again, this is driven by Jillian Jordan, my student, uh, who's interested in the signaling stuff, that um, we have another set of experiments showing that uh, another way that you can signal that you're trustworthy in general is by condemning people that behave badly. And the people see it as a signal. If I 
uh, condemn someone for doing something bad, that signals that I wouldn't do it. Um, and we actually have a theoretical model that shows how you can explain that sort of thing based on this idea of whether people move on you know, or, or stick around. Like if you're someone that's planning on, on leaving, there's no point in sticking up for someone else because you're not going to get any benefit from it. So the fact that you would stick up for someone else shows that you're kind of invested in the local community and, and will stick around. Um, but <clears throat> the, what, what makes me think about it is we also show that that means that if it turns out that you're a hypocrite, so you condemn someone for doing something bad, and then we find out that you did it yourself, people hate that. And that's seen as way worse than just lying uh, and saying you don't do it, and then, and then turns out that you did it. So when do politicians start to do this very publicly? That's the question. How do they get away with it? Yes. So, so what we show in this paper is that if, so basically we say, OK, so why do people dislike hip hypocrites? We propose a false signaling theory of hypocrisy, which is to say we don't like hypocrites. Hypocrites are worse than liars because they're engaging in this false signaling. They're getting reputational benefits by showing that they're good, which then turn out uh, to not be true. And so if that's true, that is, if that's a correct account of, moral, of, of, of why we dislike hypocrisy, it suggests that you can get around, uh, you can make hypocritical statements without really aggravating people if you kind of negate the signaling benefit. Well, that is to say, if you say, it's really bad when people do that thing, but I sometimes do it. So if you sort of admit that you engage in the behavior while you're condemning it, then people don't mind. And that's not seen, we, have, and we find in our experiments that don't, people don't see that as hypocrisy and like don't see it as unlikable because you're not trying to falsely signal that you are virtuous. And so I think with, uh, with some politicians, the hypocrisy does really cost them a lot. So like Elliot Spitzer was this person in the US who uh, <clears throat> did a lot of anti-prostitution laws and he was like a big sort of, you know, uh, he was an attorney general who was like really fighting hard against prostitution. And then he got caught uh, hiring a prostitute. And that, sent, that like ended his career because people were just like so totally outraged about it. On the other hand, you have people like Trump who spends the whole uh, campaign season talking about how terrible Wall Street is and how Clinton is in the pocket of Wall Street and then you know approximately the first thing that he does is name all these Wall Street people to his cabinet and there's sort of only mild uh, you know outrage about it <clears throat> partly it may be that it's just you know there are so many other things outrageous that he's done that people are like whatever but I think that part of it is that uh, because he had such a very clear public long history with Wall Street and with banks beforehand, nobody really credibly believed that he was anti-Wall Street anyways. So like turning out to be hypocritical in that situation, nobody, people didn't really hold it against him because nobody really believed it in the first place. And so I think that that may be a more general thing with politicians around a lot of hypocritical statements they make is that if people don't believe that the person didn't do the thing in the first place, they don't sort of get outraged by the hypocrisy in the same way because there's not false signaling going on. It's, it's a theory. Uh, Paul McGrail, Catholic Workers Group. I, I was wondering when you use the, uh, the field uh, experiments, why perhaps in lieu of that, it wouldn't have been more fruitful to, to look at successful organizations, commercial, social, which have been turned around um, and to see to what extent I, um, cooperation has played a big part in that. For, just for one example, in London there's a, there was a football team, premiership football team, which was very mediocre last season. And, this, and the only change has been the manager. One person came in and now they're top. And because people, you look at them and it's obvious that it's a big difference. People are playing for each other, they're, you know, they're sacri you know, sacrificing their individualism. And it makes me think that um, that perhaps this, you know, organization and even societies, which are more cooperative, succeed, as you were pointing out. Um, and my question would be, why not take what you know and go, go to, say, the inner cities of America where there's such friction between the police forces and the community, and find out why there is a, such a, a, what are the impediments to cooperation? Um, right. I mean, so these kinds of uh, observational studies where you sort of go to places where things are working well or go to things where, people, where places are working poorly and say, you know, what seems to be different about them or what seems to explain it is really valuable. 
there's a lot of work in organizational behavior in particular and in, in, in sociology doing those types of investigations. Um, and I think that that is interesting and that there's definitely things to be learned from that approach. But the problem <clears throat> is that you can't really infer causality, that you're just looking at correlations basically. And so like with the football uh, team example you give, first of all, there's many different attributes about the manager. You don't know what of all the different things that are different between him and the previous manager are the key things. And also, you don't really know what would have happened this season with that football team if you hadn't had a different manager. Um, you know, you can infer, but you don't have the counterfactual. And so the idea of these field experiments is to use randomization, where you randomly assign different people to different treatments so that you can really infer causality. Um, and this is a big debate uh, in economics, among other places, about there are the field experiment people and there are the econometrics people. Um, they're basically doing observational things with fancy statistical t techniques to try and tease out causality. And it seems to me that both of these approaches are, uh, are useful. Um, but the appeal of the field experiments is the ability to infer causality. Uh, Chris Tennant from uh, the LSE. Uh, you mentioned Yelp earlier, and I was interested more broadly in uh, how you would view the kind of process of likes and dislikes on social media sites and whether they constitute a good institution for, that you talked about for building cooperation or is the signaling uh, like posting that you've just donated to some charity is the signaling too calculating or perceived as too calculating for that to actually take place? It's a fascinating question and it's something that I'm thinking a lot about and working with a couple of um, on like charitable websites uh, to do some experiments on. I don't have any results to report yet, but the way that I think about it is that uh, for the charities, I think it's unambiguously good to get people to post to social media that they donated. Um, both because it may motivate other people to donate to think, oh, hey, I could get some reputational benefits from that. Um, and also because uh, it just spreads information about the charity and it helps create the sense that there's a social norm of donating to charities. But it's also totally true that if you do a very explicit a brag, basically, um, there are costs associated with that. And so Deb Wharton's group at, um, sorry, Deb Small's group at Wharton have this paper about what they call the braggart's dilemma. And so they do some experiments where they basically tell about someone that did exactly what you said, like donated to charity and then made a big deal about it. Um, and the finding is, at least in their setting, it's true that people uh, prefer someone that donates to charity and didn't tell about it, or like didn't make a big deal about it, over someone that donated and did make a big deal out of it. But they still prefer the person that donated and made a big deal out of it over a person that didn't donate at all, or that they didn't know about it. So at least in that situation, the reputational benefit of showing that you're an altruistic person outweighed the negative consequence of being a braggart, basically. Although presumably that will depend on the details of how nice the thing that you did was and how big of a deal you made out of it. Um, and so that's like a, that's certainly the sort of reputational uh, calculus. And so the thing that, that I'm particularly interested in from the perspective of the organizations is if you want to get people to share on social media that they donated, what can you do to try and get around some of these concerns about showing off? And so we're designing experiments now where we play with the messaging uh, associated with it. And so my, uh, my hypothesis is that if you do things like, instead of making the, the default, like, you know, after you donate, it, it takes you to this landing page where it's like, share on Facebook or on, that you just donated. And generally, it's something like, I just donated to such and such charity. And a, and a link, and that is just explicitly showing off. And so <clears throat> if instead you do things like, you say, help spread the word you know, about this charity to your friends so other people know about it, and you make the default text say, like, join me in supporting this great charity, or like, this charity is doing great work, X, Y, and Z, like, you know, join me in, in supporting them. That makes it feel not so much like you're showing off, but like, you know, you're trying to do a, you know, you're trying to spread the word about something good. And so we'll see how that really works or if people see through it. Um, but that's my, uh, that, that's my, those are my thoughts on it. I hope they don't watch this lecture. <laughs>
I'm uh, Viren Bogle from Langley Grammar School Sixth Form. And my question was, despite presence of compliance in a situation from an individual, would it then be dispositional or situational factors that would uh, induce cooperation? Yeah, for sure. And so I, the, the situational, there's a lot of situational factors. I think the biggest and most important class of situational factors is you know, the, what I talked about a bunch in the talk about these uh, future consequences and sort of strategic motives for cooperating. So like, if there's some kind of incentive in place that, that, it, that it's, if you're in a context where it's actually uh, self-interested to cooperate, then for sure people cooperate way more. And you can see that in the, in the data I showed. There's also lots of other things that have been um, shown, like another big one is in-group, out-group type effects. Like the more similar you feel to the other person, the more inclined you are to cooperate with them. Um, and there also are uh, a lot of individual differences. Um, we have a paper where we show that um, we have people play a bunch of different uh, economic games and play correlates within individuals across games. So if you cooperate in one game, you're likely to cooperate in other games, which suggests that there's this sort of like a cooperative phenotype, uh, we say, and it's uh, also stable. It's like as stable across time as things like risk preferences and time preferences. Um, and you can predict uh, how people play in games is correlated with their general values, like how much they think it's important to help other people uh, and things like that. But uh, what we find is that these individual differences in cooperation are not very well predicted by all of the kind of demographic uh, and personality things that you might expect. Um, so like the big five personality scale, none of those dimensions correlates very strongly with cooperation. To a little extent, agreeable people are more cooperative, but not, uh, not really very much. Um, there's actually not much of gender differences in terms of mutual cooperation. In terms of unilateral altruism, women tend to be more altruistic than men. But all of these differences are pretty small. So we have a, a machine learning paper where we try and predict people's cooperativeness based on a whole uh, battery of lots of different individual difference measures from psychology. And there's basically no signal there, um, uh, so, which we sort of in, interpret as cooperativeness or prosociality being this kind of like fundamental personality dimension uh, that's like a natural kind and not like a, um, a higher order thing, you know, built on these these lower level uh, features. So that is to say, there are stable and important individual differences, but it's not clear that they are. Uh, driven by a lot of the standard individual difference type things people think about. Uh, actually, you've just started to talk about this a little. I was interested um, in the distinction and the, 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 uh, the way that they either do or don't relate um, cooperation and altruism. Um, if I'm hearing you right, um, there's actually very little relation. Is that Am I getting that? Uh, not quite. So, so uh, they are related in the sense that um, how altruistic someone is is pretty well correlated with how much they cooperate. Because altruism is important. Like one important motivation for being cooperative is wanting to help other people. So, you know, to the extent that you like unilaterally helping others, that also is a motive to both cooperate and to trust. Um, but they also are distinct in important ways. So for example, um, I did a lot of talking about how um, cooperation should be intuitive because there are future benefits from reciprocity and repeated interactions. Um, and if you think about altruism, the story is a, little bit, uh, is a little bit different because in altruistic settings where I'm just unilaterally helping some other person, there's not the potential for mutual benefit. Um, and so, uh, like, you know, if I just, you know, give money to you and then you give it back to me, that's, you know, if you, re you reciprocate, there's not any mutual benefit uh, from that. And in particular, a lot of charitable things, you know, are giving to people that you know aren't going to be able to return the favor to you. So the only way that it can be sort of long run payoff maximizing to be altruistic is if you know that there are social norms in place that say that you should be altruistic, such that if you help this person, an observer will, will help you for doing it in a way that's sort of 
uh, more important than the cost that you paid for the altruism. And so what this suggests is in terms of whether should altruism be intuitive or not, it's going to depend on the social norms that are in place. And so that is, if my argument, again, is that the things that are intuitive are the things that are typically advantageous, then altruism is going to be intuitive for people that, who, where it's usually uh, advantageous to cooperate. That is to say, people who are required to be altruistic by social norms. And uh, a candidate for this is gender that there's this whole field of, uh, of psychology studying gender differences and attitudes around, really not so much gender differences here, but attitudes about gender, um, showing that uh, women are expected to be communal and altruistic and self-sacrificing uh, self much more so than men. Um, and that women are sort of punished for not behaving altruistically in a way that men aren't, which suggests that uh, it, you might imagine that for women, uh, it is intuitive to be altruistic uh, and not men. And so I had, did another meta-analysis of 22 of these unilateral cash transfer uh, studies. See, these are ones where rather than there being some benefit for some possibility for mutual benefit in like a cooperation, like prisoner's dilemma type sense, this is just, you get some money, how much do you want to keep, how much do you want to give to a totally random stranger? Um, and I found 22 of these studies from my lab and from other labs um, that manipulate sort of the use of intuition versus deliberation in the same way that I've been talking about before. And, uh, and whatever, this is a forest plus is a way you sort of show results from meta-analyses. Um, but uh, basically, so each one of these points is a different study. And so this is saying, is there an interaction between gender and the effect of making people intuitive. That is, does intuition work differently depending on your gender? And there's overall a very highly significant interaction such that, um, actually, maybe this is a better uh, picture of the final result here. No, that's, yeah. Uh, that um, in, uh, so the altruism is shown in blue. This is the sort of average effect of promoting intuition uh, is for women there's a big positive effect of intuition in these altruism situations, whereas for men, it's not significant, but if anything, it's in the negative direction, which is different from cooperation, the sort of potentially mutually beneficial cooperation, which from the other meta-analysis I put in here, which is in orange, which is intuitive for both men and women, because uh, you know, if there's a potential for mutual benefit, then just the kind of repeated interactions and future consequences and stuff of daily life are enough to make it advantageous to cooperate, whereas in the altruism question, you need a social norm there to support that kind of behavior. Um, so there are, this is a long way of saying they're related, but there are important differences. Um, I think we're going to have to wind up now, unless, do you have the energy to take one more question? Yeah, sure. One more question. Um, the people who share the same personality are more willing to co cooperate together. With each other, you mean? Yeah. It's a good question. I don't know of anything that's looked at that. Uh, my guess would be, in general, yes, because of general similarity, like people you know, preferring to cooperate with people that are similar to them. But it also depends on what the personality is. Because if you have a super aggressive, uh, confrontational personality, two people of that type are probably not going to like each other that much. Um, but in general, similarity breeds cooperation. Well, on Thank that you note, so much. Thank you very much indeed to David Brand.